chapter nine was about stoichiometry, and you learned about mole, and you learned how to do mole conversions. Um, and then the first part of chapter 10, they review the common gas laws, Boyle and Charles and gay -Lussac and all those. Now we get to do moles with gas. Moles with gas. And so we're going to be looking at a new law called the ideal gas law. You may have covered this in physical science. You may not have covered this in physical science. So we're going to lead up to an equation that, um, that will help you do stoichiometry with gas, which I know is something that you all have been dying to be able to do, is stoichiometry with gas. Um, so gases, molar volumes and densities. Uh, at a constant temperature and pressure, one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters. So that's kind of a handy thing. Um, you have one mole of hydrogen gas at standard temperature and pressure, which is one atmosphere and you know room temperature. Um, that mole of hydrogen gas takes up 22.4 liters. You have a mole of oxygen gas, it takes up 22.4 liters. You have a mole of carbon dioxide gas, it takes up 22.4 liters. Every gas takes up 22.4 liters as a mole, which is cool um, because if you have a volume of gas at a standard temperature and pressure, you can immediately tell how many moles there are, right? By, by the size that that gas takes up, the amount of volume that that gas takes up. This allows you to calculate number of moles of gas given its current temperature, pressure, and volume. And so uh, if you have a gas in non-standard conditions, because not every gas is sitting around at one atmosphere of pressure, not every gas is sitting around at room temperature um, at, at 20 degrees Celsius, um, you need to be able to convert whatever situation that that gas is in to standard conditions. And you can do that using the combined gas law that I showed you last week. And then once you have changed it over, you can look at, well, how much room does that gas now take? What's the volume of that gas at standard temperature and pressure? And then once I have it at standard temperature and pressure, I can convert it into moles just by looking at the volume because it always takes 22.4 liters. So imagine imagine a, a chemical reaction where you have a uh, you have two moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of oxygen gas. Two moles of hydrogen gas are going to um, take up 44.8 liters and you react that with one mole of oxygen gas, which takes up 22.4 liters. So altogether, you've got 67.2 liters of gas. And then you combine all that together and you react it so that the hydrogen combines with the oxygen and forms water vapor. You now have one mole of water vapor, which takes up 22.4 liters. And so you would have reduced your volume by a third because no matter what the gas is, any gas, at standard temperature and pressure is going to be 22.4 liters. Okay, so here's a little example question. A scuba cylinder, and that's this kind of scuba cylinder I dive with, that's a steel 95. A scuba cylinder has a compressed gas at 20 degrees Celsius and 1.55 times 10 to the fifth tor, which is 3,000 psi occupying 90 liters of volume. How many moles of gas particles are in the cylinder? Well, I don't have standard temperature and pressure because I have, um, I have 3,000 PSI, so I've, gotta, I've got to uh, adjust for that. But I, I can tell by the condition that it's in um, how many moles of gas are in that cylinder. So let's look at that. I need to use the combined gas law to adjust to standard temperature and pressure. So pressure one, volume one, temperature one, I gave this last week. Pressure two, volume two, temperature two. Put in what I know. Um, 1.55 times 10 to the fifth tor, that's a unit of measurement for pressure. Um, 90 liters of volume. Okay. And then uh, 293 Kelvin is, is 20 degrees Celsius. That's its current situation. So do we always use Kelvin? Uh, you always use Kelvin, yes. And now, 
Um, standard temperature and pressure, something that you will learn um, quickly is, is one atmosphere, or if you're using TOR, like this example question is, it's 760 TOR, which is one atmosphere, okay? And I want to be at zero degrees Celsius. I want to be at 273 Kelvin. This is standard temperature and pressure. I'm going to, I need to know what's my volume. So ideal gas law, multiply and divide to get what this equals. Okay, all of this equals 4,000. Sorry, just kidding, 47,610.9 if I just multiply and divide. So this has to equal the same thing, right? So let's let's advance, come on slide. Oh, there you go, I'm solving it over here. 47,610.9 divided by 760 times something times my unknown volume, divided by 273. So I'm gonna bring the 273 over Multiply both sides by 273, and then 760 times my unknown volume, I can divide by 760, and I get over here that my volume is 17,102.33 liters. This steel 90, steel 90 tank at 3,000 PSI holds 17,000 liters of gas. That's a whole stinking lot of gas. Whole pile of gas, yeah. How do you get Oh, there you go. 760. Oh, how did I know that? Um, there's a table in your book for standard temperature and pressure in various units of measurement. Standard pressure in TOR, which is what this example question is using, is 760. But it depends on what unit of measurement you're using. And that table is in your book for you to use. Good question. Yes. Yes. Um, so then 17,102.33, but I need to adjust for significant figures. Uh, oh, no, not yet. I have the, the volume of this gas at standard temperature pressure. Now I can determine the moles. That many liters, every liter or every mole has a volume of 22.4 liters. So that many liters, 22.4 liters per mole, and that's an awesome sound. That was and I can divide, and I get 763 moles. Um, so I need to adjust for significant digits. 760 moles of gas in this cylinder. So that's why when you go diving, um, when you go diving and you can you take just the small thing on your back, if you breathe slowly and are relaxed and calm, that can last you an hour and a half or so of being down on the bottom of the ocean because there's 760 moles of gas in there. It's a ton of gas in there. And as long as you use it slowly, um, it can last a long time. So that's, that's just an example of the kinds of things you could do with uh, converting various kinds of gases to standard temperature and pressure, okay? Because every gas at STP occupies the same volume, its molar mass determines its density. So remember that density is mass divided by volume. Well, every gas has the same volume at standard temperature and pressure. So you're dividing by the same number no matter what gas you're talking about. Carbon dioxide, oxygen, helium, uh, radon, Whatever gas you want, nitrogen, it all has the same volume at standard temperature and pressure. So uh, density is mass divided by volume. Volume never changes. Mass is the only thing that changes. So uh, when you look up a gas's density, all it is is the molar mass of that gas divided by 22.4 liters. Okay. So density is always measured in grams per liter at standard temperature and pressure. So if you were to look up on a table, what's the density of carbon dioxide, or what's the density of oxygen, or what's the density of nitrogen, it's always going to be reported in grams per liter because it's, it's molar mass, which will be a gram number, divided by 22.4 liters, um, so grams per liter, and they always report it as at standard temperature and pressure. So if you are looking at uh, what's the density of the gas right now, well, right now it might not be at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, but if you adjust for its pressure and its temperature uh, with the combined gas law, 
then you will get the density at STP. Okay, density is always measured in grams per liter at standard temperature and pressure. Um, here's a cool thing with densities of gases. Uh, and I'll pause my recording so I can show you this. What you saw there was the a, a dense gas that is um, sitting in the aquarium and not flowing out because it's denser than air. And then this little aluminum foil boat is able to sit there um, and float on the dense gas because the air inside the boat, regular room air, is less dense. So the boat floats on the dense gas just like the floating liquid. And then when he was pouring it in, he, he was causing the boat to sink. And it sank in that just like it would sink in water. So kind of a cool thing. Um, gases have density. And that's only a product of its molar mass. That's uh, because everything has the same volume at standard temperature and pressure. Okay? An ideal gas is one that perfectly obeys the kinetic molecular model. No gas is completely ideal. Most are close enough that the model is workable. So the kinetic molecular model is something that you've heard about in physical science and in this class a whole bunch, and in physics again next year a whole bunch. And the idea there is that all of matter is made up of little bits of stuff that's moving. And the little bits of stuff moving behave in predictable ways. That's the current best model for what matter is made up of, what the universe is made up of. Gases obey that model. They, they behave as if they are made up of particles in motion because they are made up of particles in motion. But every gas is a little bit funny in various ways. If you predict the way a gas is going to behave according to the combined gas law, Boyle's law, Charles law, Gato Sachs law, all these different gas laws, um, and then you go out and test them in the real world, they're always a little bit not perfect because there is a small amount of friction between these gas molecules as they bump into each other and they bump into the walls of their container, which is not um, accounted for in these gas laws. And there is a little bit of resistance as they move through, uh, through their environment, which is not accounted for. And some energy is lost. Not all the collisions are perfect. So it, it's, it's kind of a little bit wonky, the actual data versus the predicted data. But it's close enough that it works. It's a workable model, and you can use these gas laws to explain how a gas works. An ideal gas is a fictitious made-up thing that doesn't really exist, but um, if a gas were to perfectly behave the way it's supposed to and there were no such thing as friction, then gases would be ideal gases. But um, they don't actually exist. But it's a it's a fictitious construction to help us understand what's happening, okay? And as you take physics next year, you'll, you'll meet not just ideal gases, but ideal strings and ideal pulleys and ideal inclined planes and all kinds of things that are ideal in meaning they don't actually exist, but they're a way of helping you think about the situation so you can understand, okay? Um, a, when a gas gets into a very high pressure, or a very low temperature, it stops behaving like an ideal gas. And even in the standard temperature and pressure region, it's not perfect. Uh, but when you take a gas and you crank it up to a really high pressure, it stops behaving like an ideal gas and the, the laws don't help you anymore. Or if you make it really, really, really cold, it stops behaving like a gas and the laws don't work anymore. But unless you're a high pressure and low temperature, um, it's close enough, the laws work and they allow us to understand how, how gases behave. So the ideal gas law combines everything we have learned about gases into one formula. So pressure and volume, remember that pressure and volume are related to each other by multiplication. And in the, in the combined gas law, it was always P, V, P times V, right? Um, and so we leave it like that. P times V, but in the combined gas law, it's divided by temperature, P, V over T. We're not going to leave it as a division. We're going to instead move it to the other side of the equation as a multiplication value. So it's algebraically the same thing, right? Dividing on this side is the same as multiplying on this side, algebraically speaking. 
So we've just moved the t over to the other side of the equation. And then we are going to uh, relate moles of gas to its volume which is something we just said you could do because every gas at standard temperature and pressure occupies 22.4 liters per mole. So the little letter N here is the number of moles of gas, and it is related to the volume term. And it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not one mole of gas for every one liter. It's one mole of gas for every 22 liters. So 22.4. So we have to fix the, um, the relationship, because right now it looks like it's a one-to-one, -one, and it's not. So we have to fix it with this value R, which is the ideal gas constant. And depending on what unit of measurement you're using, if you're using pascals, if you're using tor, if you're using bar, if you're using millimeters of mercury, if you're using atmospheres, there's lots of measurements for pressure. Um, depending on what pressure unit you're using and what volume unit you're using, you could be using liters or milliliters. The value for R changes. So it's a table thing. In your book, in Chapter 10, there is a table for the value of R depending on various uh, units of measurement. And you do not need to, measure, to memorize the value for R. Um, it's always given to you in your book, and on the exam, I will give you the value of R that I want you to use. Okay? So, um, it's always something you just look up. But this equation, any gas at a particular pressure occupying a certain volume at a particular temperature, you can calculate, knowing what R is in that instance, the number of moles. So, I always memorized this, and I'm sorry if this offends you, I always mem memorized this as the Pufner equation, because it sounds like another word that you would insult somebody with. You're a, you're a Pufner, right? Um, yeah, but you're not. Um, Pufner, the Pufner equation, PV equals NRT, pressure times volume equals number of moles times the, times the, uh, the ideal gas constant times temperature. This is always in Kelvins. And whatever unit you're using here controls what R is, okay? So let's do a couple of examples. Um, oh, no, not examples yet. The ideal gas constant changes based on which units are used for pressure and volume. You know what, don't even bother writing this down because this is in your book. Just put this. The ideal gas constant changes based on which units are used for pressure and volume. Um, there's a table there that gives, you, gives it to you. The most common ones we're going to use are the atmospheres and liters or tor and liters, or pascals and cubic, mil, uh, cubic meters. Um, but you can see that the value of R changes depending on what units you're using for pressure and for volume. Okay, R changes, and you can look up in your table which value of R to use. Now I have an equation. There you go. Uh, 300 moles of helium gas are put into a weather balloon at sea level, one atmosphere, on a warm summer day, 30 degrees Celsius, which is 303 degrees Kelvin. What is the volume in cubic meters at launch? What will its volume be at 10,000 meters high? When the pressure drops to 0 0.2609 atmospheres and the temperature drops to negative 35 degrees Celsius, which is 238. Degrees. So I have the ideal gas law, and I'm going to use it twice. I'm going to use it once at sea level, and I'm going to use it once at 10,000 meters above sea level. Okay? So here we go. Come on. There you go. We need to use the ideal gas law for the first condition. Um, also, we need the right value for R. So for atmospheres and liters, oh, I put cubic meters. Oh, that should say liters. For atmospheres and liters, R is this, 0 0.0821. So PV equals NRT, one atmosphere times an unknown volume equals 300 moles of gas, that's the N, times my value for R in this instance, which is 0 
times the temperature at sea level on a warm summer day, 303 Kelvin. It's all just multiplication and one step of division, right? So one times V, I'm just gonna leave it as V, 300 times all of these numbers gives you this. So volume is 7,462.89 liters. Significant figures, I've only been given three, 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 two. So I should have two significant digits. So 7,500 liters of gas at launch. So I fill up my hot air, my, my weather balloon with 300 moles of helium gas. It occupies 7,500 liters of air inside that balloon. Then I let it go and the balloon rises. And now I'm up at 10,000 meters above sea level. My atmosphere has, my temperature and my uh, volume, have, I'm sorry, my temperature and my pressure have dropped. So 0 0.2609 atmospheres times the volume equals the same number of moles of gas, the same value for R, but a lower temperature. Multiply it across, and I have 0 0.2609 times volume equals this, which is the, the product of all of these numbers. Divide to get V by itself. 2,000, sorry, yes, 22,468. 0.1 liters, correct for significant digits, 22,000 liters at its peak. So I put in 7,500 liters of helium. I let the balloon go. It rises to altitude, and it gets much, much bigger. And so that, um, that same balloon will occupy 2,200, sorry, 22,000 liters at its peak. It got basically three times bigger. Okay, so... Those, those weather balloons, they look, when they launch them, they look like they're not full. But when the weather balloon gets to altitude, it's swolled up and it's gotten to be uh, a much, much bigger thing. Okay? The balloon is nearly triple in size as it ascends.